Today, we are in part three of our Grasping for God series, looking at the life and family of Isaac, Rebecca, Esau, and Jacob. We pick up in Genesis chapter 27. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son, here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I am now an old man and don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your equipment, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat, so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now Rebecca was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebecca said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, Bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat, so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so I can prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, but my brother Esau is a hairy man while I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. His mother said to him, my son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say, go and get them for me. Genesis chapter 27, verse one to 13. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God, Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Hmm, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Well, welcome to part three of our series, Grasping for God, where we've been staring as a church into the family of Isaac and Rebecca and Esau and Jacob. And if you've been tracking with us for the past few weeks, those words of Jesus, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God, may not exactly be the words that we would um, use to describe this family. I mean, it's been a bit of a gong show up to this point in terms of their dysfunction, them miscommunicating with each other, them deceiving each other and fighting and warring. But blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. And we know that even in and through their dysfunction, God still chooses to use this family. And now, if you're just tuning in for the first time and by way of review, let me give us a reminder of this like awkward family portrait that we have with this family of Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and Esau. There they are right there. Not actually, but I love the pants. Um, so the story backs up to even the series um, a, a year ago, a faithful one. You remember uh, the story of Isaac and, uh, and Abraham. So Abraham is the patriarch. He's the father of Isaac and Isaac is a bit of a miracle baby. And uh, one day um, Abraham invites Isaac to go for a little bit of an afternoon hike and almost loses his life as a sacrifice to God on a hillside. That's a crazy story. And so we know that the, the dysfunction, this interruption, this family dynamic of a weirdness 
runs deep. And so in terms of Isaac, the father, he's a bit of a distant dad and he comes from uh, that stock, from a, a distant dad experience. If you go back in Genesis, we read that there seems to be some sort of disconnection after um, the almost sacrifice of Isaac between Abraham and Isaac. And then we have Rebecca, a protective mom with a favorite son. She hears a message from, from God. Uh, she, she has these two twins g- growing in her womb and they're fighting uh, even in the womb. And she asks God like, what is going on? And God speaks to her directly and says uh, something will happen. I, it'll be different than what you're expecting, but I will use one of your sons to be a blessing to the entire world. And then we have Esau, the firstborn, big, red, hairy, good hunter, outdoorsy, bad thinker, kind of okay uh, with violence. And then finally, Jacob, the secondborn, thoughtful, more indoorsy, good thinker, uh, easily persuaded, and kind of okay with lying. Now, if you remember last week, Brexy took us through um, the, the birthright passage. And so uh, Esau sells his birthright for a cup of like yum, yum, red, red, that lentil stew. He, he sells um, his birthright to Jacob because he's super hungry. And Jacob is encouraged by his mother, Rebecca, to go and do this because she has heard from God and she does not want things to go wrong, that Jacob would lead the nations and that Esau would not. And throughout the story, we actually read that Rebecca is concerned that they might get things wrong. And so she is taking control. And so that's the family portrait that we have. And here's where we pick up the story, high drama already. Okay, so two things as uh, we jump in here today, two things that are sort of pivotal um, landmarks on the roadmap of this story, birthrights and blessing birthrights and blessings. So we know from last week that Jacob sold his birthright to his younger brother, uh, Esau sold his birthright to his younger brother, Jacob, meaning that um, Jacob would have inherited the leadership of his, his family, the authority of his father, and that he was then entitled to a double portion of this paternal inheritance. And as we'll see, as the story continues, this is a huge deal. Now, if you are uh, familiar with the book of Genesis, or even if you're not, if you back up to the story of Abraham, we read that near the end of Abraham, Abraham's life, he has amassed great wealth. And so he, he's built, um, you know, a, a, a bit of a nest egg for himself. He's acquired uh, land, he's acquired cattle, sheep. Uh, he is the picture of material blessing. And this would have been passed down through his family line. And so Isaac inherits all of that wealth and Esau should have inherited his wealth. So now, now think about the significance of that, trading all of that, all of that material wealth, the signals of blessing for a bowl of soup. This is a huge deal. The wealth that had been passed down, Esau would have uh, inherited all of that, but he sold it off. Esau acts impulsively like we heard last week and gives all this up. And then in our text today, we read that Esau now gets cheated out of blessing. So birthright and blessing, birthright and blessing, which would essentially be um, uh, the blessing of a father is essentially like the last will and testament of a father. It's, it's uh, in particular, a father's blessing would have represented the will of God, how God continues to act in the life of your family. So those two things, birthright, what you'll inherit physically, the land, uh, and then blessing, what legacy, what spiritual legacy, legacy you will carry on. Esau has given up his birthright. And today today we'll see that he loses his father's blessing at the manipulative hands of Rebecca and Jacob who are trying to get things right as well. So let's jump in and uh, turn in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 27. Uh, You can turn there now, whether you have a physical Bible with you or you're on your phone, or maybe you wanna open up a different tab and go to Bible Hub or Bible Gateway and go to Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and then all the way to uh, chapter 27. And we're actually gonna pick up the story in the quotes. We got all the way to verse 13, and we're gonna pick up the story in uh, verse 14. Genesis uh, chapter 27, verse 14. While you're doing that, I'll mention just a few things while you're finding your spots. Um, 
we're excited that so over over, uh, over our, our history as a church, we've had many different opportunities to engage in local teaching. And uh, we've been systematically and slowly, incrementally and intentionally going through the book of John with our local, local teaching experience, Jesus by John. And so whether um, you're a first time guest, you're checking us out for the first time, or you've been at the meeting house for a long time, you'll know that this is something that we return to regularly. Now we are having local teaching, yay! Uh, not next week, Brexit will wrap up this series next week, but the week week after our Jesus by John series begins. And so we are excited to engage in a creative new way to hear from, lo- uh, from some of our local lead pastors at our uh, di- uh, different regions and sites. And so stay tuned for that. It's going to be a fast, fantastic experience in just a few weeks. I will also remind us, we'll have time for one or two questions today uh, during Q&A. So make sure you're thinking about your questions and texting those in to ask or emailing those in to ask at meetinghouse.com. And we'll get to one or two of those. And then those that we don't get to, I'll invite you to tune in at two o'clock today for the after party. And if you're planning on joining us for the after party, make sure you get your questions in by noon so that we can kind of curate that list and really make good use of that time. So Jesus by John, Q&A today and the after party today at two o'clock. All right, let's jump into our text here. You have your Bibles open to Genesis chapter 27, beginning in verse 14. So we've heard that um, Rebecca has overheard a conversation between Isaac and Esau. So uh, Isaac is getting old. Now he's not about to die, but he's starting to plan out. He's getting his affairs in order. He's losing his eyesight. He's getting old. And he knows that this is the time to start thinking about the future. And so he calls Esau in and he sets up this like ceremonial meal. He says, Esau, go and uh, get some food for us. Bring in that tasty game that you're so good at hunting and I want to give you my blessing. Now it's a good reminder that these boys are not boys anymore. And just the verse before uh, Genesis chapter 27, at the end of 26, we read that the boys are like 40 years old now. So they are grown men and they wouldn't have moved away. They were living within the confines, within uh, the structure of the family dynamic. So in, in an Hebraic culture, an Israelite culture, you wouldn't like grow up and move away. You would attach your home to the family home. So you're living in close proximity to each other. And so um, Isaac calls for Esau and says, go and hunt, bring some food, let's sit down and I have prepared a blessing for you. Now, Rebecca has heard this and does not like what seems to be going on. And she calls her younger son, uh, Jacob, whom she favors and says, listen, I heard what's going to happen. Your father is going to give your older brother uh, this blessing and we cannot get, let this get in the way of what I have heard from God. And so we pick it up in verse 14. So he went out and got them. Jacob goes out and gets, uh, Rebecca encourages him to go get like, go from our local farm, go grab some like fresh meat, we'll harvest it, we'll cook it, and uh, we'll prepare it in just the way your father likes it. And we'll get this thing rolling in the right way, not the wrong way. And so he went and got them, brought them to his mother and she prepared some tasty food, just the way his father liked it, verse uh, verse 15. And then Rebecca took the best clothes of Esau her older son, which she had in the house. And she put them on her youngest son, Jacob. And she also covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with the goat skins, like you do. And then she handed to her son, Jacob, the tasty food and the bread that she had made. And Jacob went to his father and said, my father, yes, my son, he answered. And then check out this verse right here. Isaac asks, who is it? So we got the first point of deception where um, there could have been a conversation. And this is what is meant to be like the journey that we're meant to go on with this family. So Isaac just doesn't say, oh, it sounds like Esau, come on in. You haven't been gone for very long, but it's okay. Isaac stops and says, wait, who, who is it? And Jacob said to his father, I'm Esau, your firstborn. I've done as you have told me, please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. So we read of the first betrayal, the first lie, the first inconsistency that Jacob brings to his father. It's in listening, it's in hearing uh, his son's voice that is not being truthful. And Isaac asked, he pushes in further and says, how did you find it so quickly, my son? An interesting Jacob's response. He says, the Lord, your God gave me success, he replied. And then Isaac said to Jacob, okay, come near, come near so I can touch you, my son. 
to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. So we're already get big, being, um, the frame is widening so that we're getting a better and deeper picture of the dysfunction that's happening in this family. Isaac asks already, who, who is it? Is it Esau or is it Jacob? Oh, it's Esau, it's Esau. Okay. Well, it doesn't sound like him, but, but come closer, come closer so that I can, I can touch you, he says, that I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not, to whether you're the older one or the younger one. And so Jacob went close, verse 22, to his father, Isaac, who touched him and said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. So he touches him and the goat skin is freshly on there. He feels the hair because Esau, we remember, is a big, hairy, red dude. And so uh, Isaac touches his skin, he feels the hair, and he says he did not recognize him for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he proceeded to bless him. Are you really my son Esau? He asked though. I am, Jacob replies. And then he said, my son, bring me some of the game to eat so that I may, may give you my blessing, so that I may give you this, uh, this spiritual legacy. I, I can direct you, show you what God's will is and what my heart is as a father for the rest of your life. And so Jacob brought it to him, brought him the food and he ate and he brought some wine and he drank. And then his father, Isaac said to him, come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him. Jacob comes to Isaac and kissed him. Now let's pause right there. Interesting, did you catch what happened there? There are actually three betrayals, three betrayals that Jacob um, uh, imposes on his old and uh, dim-eyed father, Isaac. The first is in listening. He lies about who he is. His father hears and doesn't recognize it doesn't sound like Esau. It sounds like Jacob. And then he, he comes close and uh, by touch, he realizes, well, again, it, it sounds like Jacob, but it feels like Esau. I mean, I can feel the hair on his arms. And then the third thing that we say is Jacob betrays Isaac with a kiss. Now, where have we heard that before? So first in listening and then in coming close in physical proximity and touching, and then finally with a kiss. And this seals the deal. His father Isaac said to him, come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. And when Isaac had caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed what every son wants to hear from his father. <laughs> May God give you heaven's dew and earth's riches and abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and people bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may the son, sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. Now it's interesting, this is a blessing of, uh, of material, of uh, leadership and lordship over the land, over the family and over uh, the, the inheritance that the father, that Isaac is passing down. Now you gotta think if you are Jacob and you've heard the story of this new covenant of God, that God made a covenant with Abraham that I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars, as numerous as the, star, uh, as the stars and your new nation, which which I will create from your offspring will be a blessing to the entire world, not a curse, not a warring nation, but a blessing to the entire world. Through this nation, people will know who and how God is, that God is a God of blessing. Now that would have been obviously in the back of Jacob, Jacob's mind and likely he was expecting um, this, uh, that version of the blessing right here. And instead, what we read is that Isaac gives a physical blessing, a physical blessing. So already Jacob is like, oh my goodness, not what I was expecting. And my mom told me to come in here and do this because we figured that maybe the covenant was being passed on to Esau, but it's not. It's actually, obviously my dad is thinking that we'll be partners in this, that Esau will hold on to the, the physical reality that he will lead the nations and part of the family and that I as Jacob will inherit the spiritual blessing, that I will uh, uh, continue the covenant that God made with my father and my father father's father. So all over the place, we're seeing miscommunication, dysfunction, confusion. confusion. And so picking it up back on, uh, in verse 30. And so after Isaac finished blessing him and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. 
So again, this isn't a short time period. Um, Esau is sent out and this isn't like he would just be like hopping across the street to hunt. He's likely gone for a long time. The text doesn't tell us how long, but if you've ever hunted before, you know that you don't like go up in a tree, wait for five seconds, uh, kill whatever animal you're looking for and off you go back to the house. It takes time. So likely quite a bit of time has elapsed, but Esau comes on the scene after hunting. His brother Esau came in from hunting and he too had prepared some tasty food, food and he brought it to his father Isaac. And then he said to him, my father, please sit up and eat some of my game, my hunt, so that you may give me your blessing. So we realize that Esau has already given up his, um, his birthright, like the, the stuff, the leadership that he'll, uh, he would have inherited, uh, the wealth that he would have inherited. So, you know, we're not sure if he's feeling some regret, but he's been promised that there's this other blessing that's going to happen. And so Esau is likely encouraged and feeling like, okay, I'm not com- completely cut out of the will. And so he comes back with this fresh game uh, to, to engage in the ceremonial meal with his father, Isaac. And he says, uh, sit up and eat, eat some of my game, give me your blessing. And his father, Isaac asked him, who are you? Whoa, huge interruption right there. Who are you? And Esau says, I'm your son, your firstborn. Esau, remember, we just talked about this before I left for the hunt. I'm here doing all the things that you've asked me to do. I'm ready for my blessing. It's your firstborn son, Esau. And Isaac trembled violently. Isaac trembled violently and said, who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me before? I ate it just before you came in and I blessed him and indeed he will be blessed. And when Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me, me too, my father. Now it's interesting to note in terms of how um, certainly the narrative of Genesis is written out, we, we aren't given uh, like context for the emotion that's embedded in the text. Oftentimes the writer of Genesis just lays out the facts. Here is how it, hop- here's how it happened. But in this section in particular, we're, we're infused with the gravity, the pain and the raw emotion, the grief and the hurt that uh, surfaces with this family. Isaac trembled violently. Isaac trembled violently, upset that he has been deceived by his blood, by his sons, by his sons who he's supposed to pass on this legacy, both uh, physical and spiritual. And they've been nothing but deceptive, nothing but a gong show all the way through. And Esau with his mind on what's happened uh, probably years ago with his brother uh, um, taking his birthright or Esau selling his birthright for a cup of of stew, uh, bursts out with a loud and bitter cry. And he says to his father, he pleads with his father, bless me, bless me too, my father. I don't want to be cut out. And then Isaac responds, your brother came deceitfully and he took your blessing. And Esau said, yeah, isn't he rightly named Jacob? So uh, there's two common um, definitions or idioms that are attached to the word Jacob. One is he who grasps grabby, he who grasps at the heel. And then another, it sounds very similar to the Hebrew word for deception for liar. So Esau said, isn't he rightly named Jacob, the liar, the deceiver, the the deceiver, the, the grabber? This is the second time he has taken advantage of me. He took my birthright. Kind of, I mean, you sold it for stew, but okay. He took my birthright and now he's taken my blessing. The lineage, the legacy that I am supposed to carry on as the firstborn son. You can sense that Esau knows and feels, senses that he has lost everything, that the fracture that may have felt minimal is now a chasm in this family. And then he asked, Esau asks Isaac, well, haven't you reserved, like, reserved anything for me? Haven't you reserved any blessing for me? And Isaac answered Esau, this is so tough. Verse 37, Isaac answered Esau, I've made him Lord over you. Speaking about Jacob, I've made him Lord over you and have made all his relatives, his servants, and I've sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you now, my son? We're hearing the pain, uh, of, of these two men, just hearing the deep 
grief of what has happened. What can I possibly do for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, do you have only one blessing? Is it, is it just the one thing? Uh, you must have two. And typically this is what would happen. And so we remember uh, when Esau, um, Isaac blessed Jacob, who he thought was Esau, he blesses him with the physical. So you remember from the beginning of when we first started talking this morning, birthright and blessing. One is the, the land that you will inherit, inherit and the other is the spiritual legacy, the will of God meted, vetted through the father. And so immediately Esau switches to, oh wait, maybe that hasn't happened yet. This covenant thing that, that was passed down from Abraham to Isaac, now maybe the covenant, the spiritual leadership of this entire new nation that will be a blessing or whatever it looks like, maybe that's what we, will, will be passed to me because you've already given the physical thing to Jacob. But do you only have one blessing, my father, bless me to my father, then Esau wept aloud. Isn't there something left? His father Isaac answered him, well, your dwelling will be away from the earth's richness, away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword and you will serve your brother, but, but when you go restless, you will throw his neck from off, uh, his yoke from off your neck. You will throw his way, his leadership, if, if, if it goes left. When you become restless, when you th- see the incongruence, uh, you will throw his yoke, his leadership um, off of your neck. You'll be released from this pain. Now it's interesting, depending on what translation you have, I was just reading from the NIV, but there are a couple um, other translations that actually read the first few verses in a different way. It says, you will dwell uh, in the earth's richness under the leadership of your brother. You will dwell under the dew of heaven under the leadership of your brother. So something is happening. There's still some element of confusion of like, how will this all work out? And it's not spelled out, but what we do know is that now both options of, of physical inheritance and spiritual inheritance are now off the table for Esau, but there is like a small smidgen, a a tiny silver lining where uh, Isaac says to Esau, this won't be forever. You won't be, you won't suffer uh, at the hands of your brother. When you feel restless, when it, when you get to be restless, uh, you will, the, the yoke, his leadership will be taken off of your neck. You will throw his yoke from your neck. And we'll stop there for now. (sighs) So this family is supposed to be gathering for a ceremonial meal, his father and older son for blessing to show this is how this will work in the future. A mother and younger son get in the way because they also feel like that they've, uh, they've heard from God and that this is the way that God must be wanting to do things. They get in the way, they practice deceit. Jacob deceives his father three times through listening, through touch and through a kiss and receives both the physical and spiritual blessing. Meanwhile, Esau comes back from hunting, thinking finally I will get what's mine and the complete opposite happens. And it isn't like Isaac is like, Matt told you what goes around comes around and said, Isaac is deeply troubled, hurt, horrified. He trembles violently at what his family now looks like about what has become of his relationship with his sons and by inference, his relationship with his wife, Rebecca. And then we're left with the scene of desperation where Esau is like, is there nothing left? Is there nothing left? Please bless me with something. And the only thing uh, that Isaac can offer is you will be under the leadership of your brother. You will be under the leadership of God who knows best. You will suffer, your life will be difficult. Your faith will grow, grow through the hard soil of just hard work, but it won't be too much that you can handle. It won't overwhelm you. And when you feel restless, when you get to the end of your rope, uh, your yoke, this way, this leadership, if it's destructive will be thrown off and you'll be set free. And that's where the text ends. Now, in just a second, we're gonna jump into some Q and A, but we have, uh, man, taken in a lot of information at this very desperate and emotionally charged uh, story. And I would love for us to do just a bit of a collective temperature check right now. So as we just walked through kind of verse by verse that section, how are you feeling right now? Honestly, you read that text. What does that, what emotion does that conjure up in you? For me, having read through it a couple times now, I just feel hurt. I feel broken and, and, and frustrated for the mess that this family has become. 
and in studying it over the past few weeks, I, I'm, I'm, I find myself almost like maybe you too, find myself almost like a little ticked off at each character. Like, Isaac, why weren't you more intentional with your sons? Like, why didn't you throw a ball around or go out hunting? Or, or why is there this perceived dis- distance and dissonance with, with your boys? And Rebecca, like, why are you trying to manipulate, manipulate God's will? Don't you know that he really is in charge and that he's for you, not against you? That he is walking alongside you, not apart from you? And Esau, like, man, come out from outside, come inside, spend time with your family, try to forge connection, not distraction and disconnection. And Jacob, for the love, tell the truth, you know, stand up for yourself. Know that God is speaking to you too. That, those are the, that's sort of the inner dialogue that I go through as I read the story. And maybe uh, you're in the same boat right now. But the beauty of this text uh, is that it's meant to show us the propensity for human damage and disconnection when we rely on our own impulses and our own selfishness. In fact, some scholars would say that that's exactly the point. The point of this story is to show the destructive nature of what Israel could uh, become on their own without staying connected to God. That humanity, that Israel in particular, that the Hebrews have tremendous potential to do damage, but that humanity also has tremendous potential to do good when they stay connected to God. And the beauty of this text is that it shows this family warts and all. It shows our propensity for stubbornness and and selfishness, suffering, deception, division. And yet God still uses these broken people, this broken family to continue to move a nation in the direction of blessing. That God doesn't and hasn't given up even when it seems like this family has gone completely off the rails. All right, let's pause there. Um, Carmen, we'll, uh, we'll head over to you and let's throw it open to, uh, to some Q&A. So what are uh, some questions that have come in? Oh, my friend, there have been so many good ones. It's going to be like such a meaty after party. So I, yes. we, I know we only have time for a few. Uh, so let's see what we can do here. Uh, we'll just do a couple. So Dell asks, uh, does this story embolden deception? It's like there's such a focus on it. Is it, is it kind of propping it up a bit. Answer that one. Thanks, Del. Um, yeah, thanks, Del. Great question. No, no, quite the opposite. In fact, um, when we read about Isaac's uh, response, Isaac could have very well responded uh, with, well, but for the will of God, I exist. You know, it's not my business to feel any emotion. God is going to do what God is going to do. And so deception or not, whatever, it's up to him. No, there's, there's a human, there's a deep emotional reaction where uh, Isaac is upset. So is Esau. And even before Jacob just doesn't take it like, um, you know, when he's encouraged to deceive his, deceive his father, he just doesn't take it on the chin and say, okay, I guess that's what we do. We lie in this family. Instead, Jacob questions his mother and says, and says, hold on, but that could be perceived as being tricky. And wouldn't then instead of blessing a curse fall on me. So we're getting all of these inferences of like what, like I said, um, the propensity for human deception and division and uh, selfishness looks like, and that God through the story of pain, grief, and disconnection is showing a better way. So yeah, it might seem like at first pass, just reading, um, you know, glossing over the, de- the, the text that like this, this props up deception. But as we continue the story, it's showing us a very different way that this is what happens when things go off the rails, but thank God that God is putting things back on the rails and leading us towards uh, the reconditioning of our human character, uh, which we'll see when we jump back into the book of Matthew, um, but also the corrective nature, the correction that God brings into the story of, of pain, that things are not good, that deception leads to brokenness. So yeah, thanks for that question, Del. That's Is there fantastic. another one? Yeah, we'll, we'll do one more here. Sure. Uh, a few had a similar sort of vein here around the blessing. So Jacob asks, since uh, James asked, sorry, since Jacob took the blessing through deception, mm-hmm. why couldn't it be rescinded and put on Esau? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, I will welcome you to the after party. We're gonna be covering a little bit more uh, meat and potatoes uh, at the after party. It's a, I have, we don't know. And that's the, the, the beautiful part and equally frustrating part of this, of this uh, section of scripture, in particular, chapter 27. We don't get the but, we don't get the but, ah, but God is and, and will, we're, we're just left with the raw human emotion. The point is to focus on the story of what happens when humans look inward at their own wants, desires, needs, and how they feel like they've heard things instead of outward uh, to the spirit of God that is leading towards um, other centeredness and love. 
So, but tune in for the after party. We'll definitely be covering uh, more of that. Thanks for your questions, friends. And like I said, 2 p.m. the after party, it will be a good one. All right, let's turn over uh, with the time that we have left. Um, turn over in your Bibles to Matthew uh, chapter five, verses three to 10. So we leave chapter 27 of Genesis knowing that this is a family that is broken that is fractured and that is wondering how on earth will the will of God repair this? How will, on earth will, be, will, will we be a blessing when we're so broken already? And now we fast forward to Matthew chapter five and uh, Jesus is on the scene. He, he has taken some of the most, most marginalized people uh, that are around and he's walked up onto a hillside to teach. And then he takes um, a, a closer group of his followers called the disciples, uh, uh, young men and women, and he teaches them specifically. Now, again, remember the disciples were those that were completely outcast by religion, the most broken, uh, the people that religion had pointed to and said, you don't get it. You are not blessed. You don't count. Off you go. Return to the trade of your father or your family and don't try and get this religion thing right. Uh, Just follow the law and off you go. And Jesus chooses those people, the most broken, the most ostracized, the most divided and invites them uh, into his uh, inner circle. And then we launch into the Beatitudes, Matthew uh, chapter five, verse three. And the word Beatitude just means the blessing, the blessing. And so how does Jesus bless? In light of the story that we've just read of, uh, you know, land and stuff and spiritual legacy, how does Jesus choose to bless these broken young men and women? The blessing, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice and righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, there it is, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, because of striving for what is right, for theirs is the kingdom of God. So to summarize that, like this is an absolutely upside down way of understanding and coming to grips with how God blesses. Now, as a young Jewish man or woman hearing, the, when, you heard, when you heard the word blessing come out of the mouth of Jesus, you would have said, okay, okay, okay. So this is going back to covenant. This is where like God gives us the land and we'll occupy Jerusalem, we'll overthrow the Romans, it's gonna be amazing. And we'll have this spiritual legacy that will continue on. Life is going to look up as long as we cross all of our T's and dot all of our, uh, all of our I's, as long as we adhere better and more faithfully to religion. And Jesus Jesus subverts that understanding and gives a whole different picture of blessing. He says it like this, you are blessed when you doubt. You are blessed when you suffer through faith, when when faith grows through the hard soil of just life. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. You're blessed when you grieve, when you mourn, when you're in pain, when you feel like you've lost what's most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with the simplicity of your life and who you are, meekness, simplicity. You're blessed when you're hungry to know God, when you persist and you lean in, don't pull uh, away, when when you seek after justice and righteousness. You're blessed when you care for people, not just for amassing wealth or a healthy retirement savings plan, but you're blessed when you care for people and when you show mercy, other centeredness and empathy. You're blessed when your heart is pure, when your heart and mind are being shaped by God, when you're living with purity, honesty, and integrity. You're blessed when you long for peace and connectness, when you're, when you're an active part of peacemaking in the world around you, whether it be in your family, with your friend groups at school, uh, at work, or with your extended family or in, uh, in your church. You're blessed when you long for peace and connectedness, not selfishness, ambition, and division. And finally, you're blessed when you go through pain. You're blessed when you're persecuted and put down, humility. Man, what an encouragement that is. 
I'm sure as we read through that list, uh, we can all find ourselves somewhere in there, doubting, grieving, longing for justice, wanting to be faithful, wanting to be pure of heart, wanting to be other centered and empathetic, wanting to be shaped by God to live an integral uh, life, wanting to be a peacemaker and wanting to be humble. Those are the things that we strive for. And this is this upside down new way of covenant of blessing that Jesus invites us into. We also don't get a picture, a picture of like um, cancel culture either. We don't see Jesus go, oh, but if you do any of these things wrong, or if you don't meet these requirements, you're out, I don't love you, go away. And so Jesus invites everyone, everyone, in particular, the most marginalized people who are sitting in front of him at the time. And he reminds and reminds and reminds, you will experience blessing, it's already done. You are deeply loved as my kids, as God's kids. Remember from last week, Brexy said, God does not want grandchildren, he wants children, kids. And this is what Jesus is, in, is inviting his earliest followers and us to today. This is God's spiritual blessing to us, not wealth, not land, but each other in union with God, each other in union with God, spiritual family that loves each other and works together for good. Friends, we are beautifully broken but deeply loved by God. We are beautifully broken, but deeply loved by God. And it's in and through that brokenness, just like we saw in the story of this dysfunctional family. And like, we'll continue to hear uh, next week that despite our brokenness, God still wants to use us to reshape, to recalibrate uh, us, uh, to be, to be um, light and love uh, and to be a blessing to the world, that our brokenness does not cancel us from doing that, does not omit us from the blessing of God. It's already ours. And we're invited into the process of leaning into it fully. Now, I don't know where you're at right now, but as I track through those stories, as I read through Genesis 27, and as I'm reminded of Matthew 5, I can see myself in different points in the story. I can see my own um, brokenness. I can see my own pain. I can see my own propensity for selfishness, but then I'm so encouraged by God's invitation through Jesus um, to something that is better, to something that is more inclusive, to something that is more inviting to the love of God that is deep and wide and, and, and soaking, washing over us and is meant to bless us so that we as spiritual family can bless the world. Now, wherever you're at, I would love to give us just for uh, a few minutes, maybe like 20 to 30 seconds, just to consider uh, where we're at. Maybe you're hearing this today and you're like, I'm a mess. Like that family uh, that we read about in chapter 27, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, and Esau, they look good compared to what's going on in my family. And maybe you feel so discouraged and disqualified from the will of God or the blessing of God. Brother, sister, may we be reminded that we aren't that God's love is far and wide for us, not against us, that God doesn't reserve his blessing, but invites us into the blessing of this new kingdom. So I'd love for us to just take 15 to 20 seconds and be reminded of that. And then I would love to lead us in a prayer. So let's take just a few seconds right now. And now collectively, communally, as spiritual family, no matter where you find yourself, I would love for us to read this prayer together. You'll see it come up on the screen here. It's very simple, but I think it so captures uh, certainly uh, the experience that we've just gone through and reading through a family dysfunction, but also the blessing that is ours in Jesus. And so this prayer goes like this, God, I admit my brokenness. I receive your love and I want to be a blessing to the world. Let's pray that together. God, I admit my brokenness. I receive your love and I want to be a blessing to the world. God, would you give us courage and connectedness as spiritual family to be a blessing, to see parts of our world and our own uh, life that are broken and to reach in with grace, forgiveness, mercy, compassion, humility, and love. In the areas of our life where we struggle, would you continue to 
encourage our faith and our hearts that you have not left, that you continue to journey with us by your spirit and that you are wanting to take us somewhere that is better. God, in those moments where we find ourselves deeply discouraged, deeply impacted by um, whether it be family or work or school or COVID-19, may your peace rule over our hearts. God, we admit our brokenness, we receive your love, and we want to be a blessing to the world. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. And now I'd love to leave us, uh, just before we cut back over to Carmen, I would love to lead us um, in a benediction. And a benediction is just that same thing, as it's, it's blessing, it's uh, good words to end with. And so this comes out of Numbers chapter six. Now, my brothers and sisters, in the beauty of our collective brokenness, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord smile upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. And together we all said, amen. Hi, I'm Rexy. Thanks for tracking with the Meeting House teaching. If you wanna see more videos by us, just click right here. If you wanna see what our youth and our kids are learning, you click here. And if you wanna be notified anytime we post a new video to make sure you don't miss a teaching, then you subscribe by clicking right here. Thanks again for tracking with us.